Well, hello, and thank you everyone for being here today. My name is Jen Bentley, and I'm the Alumni Engagement Officer for the Faculty of Health. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that much of the work of the University of Waterloo takes place along the traditional territory of the, sorry, let me start that over again. Um, that I'd like to acknowledge that much of the work of the University of Waterloo takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Track, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within the Office of Indigenous Relations. Here in the Faculty of Health, we are fortunate to have Indigenous Knowledge Keeper Elder Henry with us to support us in our learning and creating many opportunities for us to learn as a community. I'm very excited to welcome everyone to our office hour today, featuring Andrea Gardy. Uh, bringing alumni back to connect with our students is an important priority for both the Faculty of Health and the broader university. Our alumni help show students what's possible. The success they've had and the stories they share help to shine a light on the path for students who might be wondering what their own futures will look like. So we host these office hour sessions every term. Um, I do invite you if you have any requests for specific careers you'd like to hear from or individuals you'd like to see, um, please do share your ideas in the chat um, as we plan for our future events. Um, now, in order to make the most of our small group session, we do ask everyone to turn their cameras on. I think we've already completed that task, so that's great. Thank you all for being here. And uh, what we will do is start with some quick introductions. Um, although maybe everyone's already met. Do, have you met everyone already, Andrea? Yes. Okay, so I don't think we need to do introductions again, um, but uh, what we will do is I'll just pass it right over to Andrea and you can share your story with us from your time at Waterloo to where you are now. Perfect. Thanks everyone for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. I always like to come back and anything that I can work with the University of Waterloo. I'm really happy to do it because it was such a great part of my journey so far. Um, so I'm just going to start off by talking about my um, career journey and um, where I started from and then where I am right now. And then I just have a couple slides with some um, tips and tricks that I think I could share. Um, so I was born and raised in Waterloo. Um, so I actually went to high school just up the street um, at Waterloo Collegiate. Um, and um, I started off my uh, undergrad degree at Laurier in their uh, co-op program for business. I did my first two years there. Um, my first co-op term was with the federal government in, in Ottawa in the parliamentary precinct branch. Uh, so they work on the day-to-day -day operations of Parliament Hill. Um, and that was a great experience uh, around project management. Also, and while it wasn't specifically tourism, it was in a very tourism rich place um, and it was a great experience. After my second year, I transferred to Western um, to their business program, which is year three and year four. So the Richard Ivey School of Business. Um, my, my, uh, and I have a lot of lessons that I took from there. Um, they're set up a bit different in terms of their um, class structure. So you stay in one class with a cohort and then professors will come to you. So you spend all day in the same room with the same 70 people and every class is a case. And I'll get into why I think I really learned a lot from that and what, uh, as you transition into your careers, what like some tips and tricks that you can learn that I took from that. Um, my first summer, um, so year three, I worked for FedNAR. And FedNOR is the Economic Development Agency for Northern Ontario. It's the federal government again. I worked in Sault Ste. Marie. And I worked in their tourism department. And I, that was a great experience. And it really did spark my passion for tourism. And I got to work with some pretty cool people and some pretty cool operators, including the Polar Bear Rehabilitation Center and the Bush Plain Museum. And what I loved about it was I got to work with these people that are so passionate about their particular interest and I thought I could really help them as well and I could bring my knowledge and my undergrad degree in business to provide 
support for some of the things that they maybe weren't as passionate about, like governance, like finance, like some of those other business aspects. So then I did my uh, fourth year at um, Ivy, but I did my last semester abroad um, in Rotterdam in the Netherlands at uh, the university in Rotterdam. Um, that was a great experience. It was the furthest I'd ever been away from home. And I got to be surrounded by other international students and learn and also learn with local people. Once I graduated, I uh, worked as a category analyst for uh, Spinrate, which is a yarn company in Listowel, Ontario. They at the time, and I, I think they still are, were one of the largest manufacturers and di distributors of yarn. And as a category analyst, I was responsible for forecasting um, how many balls of yarn various stores would sell, including uh, Michael's and some of the other large consumer packaged goods stores. Um, and I did that for two years and it was a great time and I learned a lot. Um, but I kept thinking about how I wanted to work in tourism. So I decided to go back to school and that's what brought me to the University of Waterloo. So I got my uh, master's and at the time the program was called Tourism Policy and Planning um, in the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies. Um, and uh, I did the thesis a stream of that and my thesis was on visitor satisfaction at a local festival and I chose Oktoberfest um, having grown up in Kitchener Waterloo it was the one of the largest ones here and I thought it would be fun um, so I got to go collect uh, surveys from some pretty drunk people at fest halls <laughs> at Oktoberfest and I remember when I was meeting with Oktoberfest the festival organization before to get permission and to make sure it was okay they said, yes, but under two um, requirements. One, I had to wear a traditional dirndl while I went was at the festival. And then two, um, I would have to be accompanied by like basically a bodyguard that they, they provided. And they also gave me little buttons that I could give out to anyone that completed the survey. And I was like, well, I don't really think that's necessary. Like, I'll be okay. And they're like, no, like, it'd be good. And I'm glad I had it because people at October, like they went crazy for these buttons. Like people really wanted to fill out their survey because they really wanted the buttons. So it was able to uh, keep me a bit more safe uh, with those large group of people. After I graduated with my master's, I took a contract uh, with a destination marketing organization or a DMO up in Kawartha Lakes. So Fenelon Falls, Bob Cajun, Lindsay. Um, I did that for, uh, I didn't quite finish my one year contract because I was headhunted uh, through LinkedIn. So another great tip is make sure that you have your LinkedIn up to date. Um, and RTO4, who is the regional tourism office for Waterloo Wellington here in Perth, they were looking for a project manager. Um, so I interviewed, they, they uh, reached out through this uh, recruitment firm. Um, I interviewed and I got the job and I started there in 2015. So that's kind of my journey. And um, since starting at RTO4, I started as a project manager. Um, and so I would, uh, I would uh, develop projects, come up with budgets, track deliverables, track the scope, execute um, various projects. And I can get into day-to-day -day what it's like if you guys would like, but um, I then got promoted to senior project manager. From there, director of projects and operations, where I would help um, provide strategic support for the organization and help the other project managers as well. And then in January of 2020, I took over the role of executive director. So I've been with the organization for about eight years now, and it's been great. Uh, just a couple trends that I thought I would mention that we're seeing in the tourism industry. The first is, is kind of the mandate of, of us as an organization and working in tourism. Um, RTOs have been around for about oh just over 10 years now. Um, October 2010 was was the date. And our mandate was very much get heads in beds. It was about growing tourism receipts. It was about more, more, more. And now we're seeing the mandate really change to be something like, how can you improve the quality of life of residents through the economic benefits of tourism, as well as the other great benefits of tourism that, that happens um, for, for both residents and visitors. So we're seeing that shift. And that really changes how we how we have criteria for projects, who's involved in the projects, um, 
And right now what we're trying to figure out is what is the best way to engage residents in decision-making? Because it wasn't really done very often in the past. Another trend that we're seeing is distributed storytelling and just how um, distributed the world is now. If you think about how you um, go on a trip, it's really different now than it was 20 years ago. If you think about how people are inspired, how people get their information, how people share, um, it went from, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would go to a travel agent who they were the keepers of the information. And now you're getting your information through social media. You're getting it from your friends. You're getting it from people like influencers and people that you follow online. You're not getting it just in one place that we can all, we're all part of telling the story. And it's the way that visitors and residents can tell the story is really important because I, as a tourism organization, could tell you to go to, to XYZ Festival or to go to this location. But at the end of the day, you know I'm getting paid for that. Whereas if someone in your network shares about um, a new experience or something like that, you're going to believe it more. It's more authentic. And, and that story is very important. So we look at how can we invent, invite or incent other peoples to tell the story for us. And sometimes it's really hard to give up control, like you you want it to be your way, but the value I think is so much bigger through distribution. And then the third trend that I wanted to highlight was just about experiences and how, ex how important experiences are in the tourism industry. A couple of things of what people are looking for, people love limited editions. If it's harder to get, um, people get really excited about that. They also like to be surprised and delighted if there's something unexpected about your experience. They also want hands-on things. So whether it's learning how to make something or um, trying something out, they want to get their hands dirty and that makes their experience so much more fulsome. They also kind of like limited edition. They like access to restricted areas. They like to see behind the scenes um, and how things are made. And um, again, if it can be exclusive just to that, it's a value add to those people. And then finally, it goes back to um, user generated content, but shareable moments. So what in your experience will get someone to take out their phone and take a picture? Because that's right now the great way to share memories and remember. Um, just a couple tips and tricks um, that that I'm I'm learning um, about transitioning to the business world and just working with co-op students and working with people that are newly graduated. The first thing I wanted to talk about was finding the right work environment for you. And it's different for each person, but I'm finding after COVID, an added challenge is a lot of workplaces are becoming virtual. And if it's your first like office job or um, first kind of uh, transition to the business world, a, a virtual job might not be for you. You might want to focus on job listings where you can go into an office, even if it's maybe not every day, but where you can be around your coworkers because a lot of learning is done just by being there and soaking in and hearing other people's conversations and being part of meetings. And it can be really isolating to be by yourself at home. So making sure that when you're going for interviews, that you're asking Usually at the end, they'll say, do you have any questions? And making sure that not just that you're the right fit for the job, but that the job is the right fit for you because you want to go into a place where you think you can succeed. And I think that's, that's one way. The other one is to not be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, there, there really isn't any bad questions, just like there's no bad ideas. Sometimes really good things can come out of people asking questions. Even if it's as simple as like, why do you do it this way? There could be a really good reason why it is. Um, so don't be afraid. Don't think you're a nuisance. Um, you might be a bit intimidated if you're in a big meeting and you don't want to speak up. So just write your questions down and then you can ask people after too. And you'll get more confident, I think, um, asking questions in person too. The other thing is about... Um, you're, you're especially new in your career, you're not expected to know the right answer. And it's not about having the right answer. A real key to success is just thinking through the process of how could you come up with the best 
um, data-driven decision-making. Um, and so sometimes it goes back to the question. So if you don't know the answer to something, how can you work through a process to come up with it? So what questions do you need to ask? What information is currently out there? Um, can you look at other ex examples, experiences, and so forth? And when I was at Ivy, um, the, uh, when I was at Western, all of our classes were case studies. So every day, every class, every day, we would have four or five a day would be a case study where it's here's the problem. Now, what would you do? And as a class, you would you would talk about what what kind of your process is. Um, so that's something that that I think is valuable to work on. The other um, thing that I want to mention is um, and this is the point of the cover up is worse than the crime to not be afraid when something goes wrong. It is much better to just explain what happened, to come clean, to say this, I did this, I think it was a mistake, what should I do? Um, I'll give an example of something that happened this year where I had a new employee and um, they, they, they couldn't set up their, uh, we use voice over internet because we work sometimes in an office, sometimes at home, and they couldn't get their voicemail set up. And um, so I was working with this employee and uh, it was, it was, we had to be on hold um, with the tech person and, and it took us a long time to figure it out, hours. Um, and I was on, I was on the phone with the tech person and they said, um, well, I see you had another employee that started is theirs working? So I, I called the other person and I said, is it working? And the person said, yep, I got it working. I tested it, but it turns out that was a lie. So they, they didn't have it set up. And because they weren't truthful in that scenario, I said, oh no, it's working. There's no big deal. I fixed the other person's problem, hung up. And then the person tried to get set it up for themselves, but there was an issue. So it didn't work. And then a little while later, they had to come to, to me and say, it. and it, it, it made the work for other people in the organization and the tech person doubled because it could have just been solved when we asked the question. They would not have gotten in trouble for not having their voicemail set up at the time, but because they, they weren't truthful when something went wrong, it made it harder for everyone. So don't be afraid to just just when something happens, just explain how it happened. You can talk about what you learned from it, what you do differently, um, but, but don't lie. And then the last point I wanted to talk about was thinking about your audience. This is the thing that I've noticed the most about people transitioning from being in school to being in the office. And you're taught a certain way to write essays, to do reports, and it's very different from a lot of the business world who, you know, they can't read a 10 page essay. They need a one page, you know, with bullet points and pictures and quotes and infographic. Like people digest information differently depending on who they are, what they're using the information for, et cetera. So it's really important to think about if you're working on a project, who will use this and how do they need the information. And again, you can ask those questions. And then this is my last slide, I believe, and it's how to network as an introvert. Um, I'm very introverted. I get very, very overwhelmed in large groups, going to conferences. I have nightmares. I get so nervous going into it, but it's important. And so a couple of tricks that I've learned. The first one is to find an extrovert and to <laughs> you guys can go into it as a team. So find someone that um, doesn't mind going up to strangers, can start the conversation, and then you can jump in as part of this, but you're not the one initiating it. So you guys can work on it together. The key thing for this though, is to find someone that wants to go to that, to network with other people, not that you use each other as a, cr as a crutch to not talk with other people. So it's finding the right person. The other thing is to brainstorm questions ahead of time. Um, is there certain information that you're really interested in? Just come up with a list of topics that you think that you can talk about with people so that you're not just panicking and not knowing what to say. Uh, the third point was to not be afraid to take breaks. Um, there's been times at large networking events where 
I just get overwhelmed with how many people are there and I just go sit in the bathroom for a couple of minutes or I just I go outside and I get some fresh air um, and and that's okay. I also like to set a goal for myself. So whether it's I'm going to meet five new people and that's my goal and I can go home after I do that. Um, and normally I, I'm able to go above and beyond my goal, but it lets me kind of uh, gamify the situation a little bit. Um, and also feel good when I get home because, you know, I've hopefully accomplished my goal. And then finally, I just put repetition of events. Often conferences, people will go to the same conference. So if you met five people this year at the conference, if you go next year, you probably know those five people and then you can meet five new people and it snowballs so that each year it gets easier and easier to go to a certain thing because you've met people. Um, so those are just a couple slides that I did want to mention, uh, and here's my contact information. It's Andrea at rto4.ca. I'm really passionate about helping people early on in their careers, and so I'm always happy to, um, you know, grab coffee or do a virtual um, phone call or, or meeting with someone to talk about, you know, what are you thinking about doing, asking, you know, I'm happy to look over resumes and get feedback um, answer any specific questions that you have. I'm happy to um, provide some mentorship support there. Um, and so don't hesitate to reach out. But yeah, happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing all that with us. Um, I put your email in the chat there just in case anyone joins and just needs a chance to copy and paste it as well. Um, but yeah, so we can jump into Q&A. Um, if anyone, if you have questions, um, I do invite you to use the reactions button to raise your hand um, and ask away, and then you can unmute um, to ask your question directly to Andrea. And um, if there are no questions, there were some submitted in the registration, so we can ask some of those as well. Um, so maybe we can start with one of those, give people a chance to think about what questions they have. Um, so yeah, so one of the questions that was asked um, was what skills have helped you advance your career at the RT, at RTO4? Yeah, um, I think the ability to answer the question, so what? So if you know something, or, or, you know, you have to say, so what? what? What can you use that for? Um, if you collect research, what can you use the research for? Um, I think that's that's been really key. And it's the ability to move from insight to action. So if you, if you think of something, what can you do with it? Um, and what recommendations can you give? Um, I think also creativity has been really important. Um, and then different levels of communication. So um, writing clear emails was something that I, I, I really had to work on. Um, how do you structure, you know, um, and how do you reach out to new people versus people that you know? Um, so communication, both in-person, email, meetings, presentations. Um, and then the other one I would say is just initiative. Um, it's, it's one thing to be able to follow recommendation or to be able to follow instructions. Um, it's another thing to, to also like come up with ideas and, and come up with an action plan and present it and present, make the case of why you think that's a good idea and maybe why you should do it and why you should pilot it. Those are some of the, the skills that I think have really helped me succeed. Um, and then before the next question, I'll also just mention, uh, also, there are certain skill sets um, that is good in any industry um, that often um, in tourism and arts and culture and hospitality, like having really strong financial, like can you um, can you come up with a budget? Can you read a budget? Can you um, track expenses and read a balance sheet? Um, those things have been really helpful. Um, one that I'm always working on is like conflict. Uh, I am a people pleaser by nature. And so being able to give harder feedback has been difficult for me. Um, so that's something that I'm still working on in the future, but is important when you're working with people that you can have this dialogue 
um, when it's not always, you know, happy, um, but can you still work together and, and get to a common goal? Awesome, thank you. Um, Sophia, I don't wanna steal your question if you even remember what you put in registration, but if you don't, I can read it on your behalf. <laughs> Um, maybe if you prompt me, but I'm sorry, I have no idea what I read. No problem. It was, um, you asked, what was one opportunity you wish you would have taken advantage of while a student? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I think I would have gone away to school for my first two years as opposed to staying in town. Um, it saved me a lot of money. So that was, you know, I don't regret it, but I think, um, I think it would have helped me get me out of my shell a bit more. And I would have been, I think, more, not forced, but I probably would have felt more comfortable taking advantage of some things on campus like clubs. I would have been more involved in clubs, taking some leadership in clubs, I think is a great opportunity to really strengthen your resume. And because it was so easy for me to go home and then I didn't want to go back to campus if I was home at night, things like that, I think I think that made me have a bit of a slow start to my university career. So I definitely would have been, tried to have been more involved and I would have pushed myself out of my comfort zone a little more by um, doing, you know, case competitions or um, again, other clubs that I think would have, I would have met new people, would have tried new things. Um, going on the international exchange was a great opportunity. So I would definitely recommend that to for other people as well, if that's a possibility. Um, yeah. Great. Um, does anyone, I feel like I'm gonna ask all the questions, but does anyone else have one they wanna jump in with? Carlo, awesome. Um, so a question I have for you is, um, what did you find in your uh, recreation and leisure studies degree that you found valuable in your work experience? Yeah. Um, so my, uh, I did my master's program there um, in recreation and leisure studies. So my classes um, were at that level. And so I learned a lot about research methodologies, both qualitative and quantitative, that I didn't have for my undergrad degree. So that was really valuable. But I think the main thing that I took away from my from my degree um, from that program was around writing a thesis. That was the largest project that I had ever worked on up until that point. And it felt really overwhelming. The idea of like, you're going to write a couple hundred page book, basically, um, seemed like unrealistic to me. I didn't know how it was possible to do. Um, and and so one, the degree gave me the tools to come up with a research project, execute the research project, and then write about the research project. But then two, it gave me the confidence that I can handle a really large project. And the way that I can handle a really large project is by breaking it down into chunks. Um, and it felt a lot less overwhelming. And so I came up with goals for myself. I piloted a whole bunch of different um, structures in terms of how I could how I could set up my days because once I was writing my thesis, you don't really have a schedule of classes because you're working on your thesis. And a bunch of people I went to school with like just stopped working on it because they had that freedom. Um, but I really forced myself to come into school um, four or five days a week. Sometimes I gave myself Fridays for a certain number of hours per week or per day. And I gave myself a goal to write, you know, two pages a day. So like 500 words. Um, and that's how I was able to succeed and, and write the book. And I was able to take that skill set back to when I work to learn how to take big projects and chunk them down to something realistic. And make a time management that that works that you could get things done so it was a really valuable experience great question thanks Mariana go ahead 
Okie dokie. So could you tell us about kind of like the week in your life in your current role and also how that has evolved from like your master's degree onward into Archie over? Sure. Yeah. Um, so my week when I was a project manager looks very different from my week now being the executive director um, because and it's it's less hands on now. So when you're when I was a project manager, I was the one executing projects. Whereas my role as the executive director is to is to make sure that the people that work for me, that work for this organization, have the resources, have the tools, have the um, strategy and the time so that they can execute the projects. And that was a really big shift in my mind because I, I love doing things. Um, and I it was almost easier for me to just do it. But in the long run, that's not sustainable. So my week um, now is I unfortunately have to do a bunch of boring stuff um, because I have to, you know, I would be the one that meets with the auditors, meets with the accountants, meets with, you know, a lawyer if we need to, an HR. It's all of those like organizational administration things that happen with um, with running an organization. Um, but um, monthly we'll have budget meetings. So we'll look at if our budget is um, like, let's say um, this year of, uh, we had 5 million that we had to distribute for uh, a, a program called TRF. Each month, we look at um, how much, how what was our budget? How much should we spend this month? How much should we think we would spend this month? Are we ahead of schedule? Are we behind schedule? Why is that? Um, so it's all of these kind of program questions, the project managers to make sure that our year goes on scope, on schedule, on budget. Um, and then each in the morning, I meet with all of my project managers for something called a stand-up meeting. And because we are virtual, some of us um, are virtual 100% of the time. Some people work in an office 100% of the time. And then like myself, I'm hybrid. So I work a couple of days in the office. I work a couple of days at home. And it was really important that we stayed connected as a team. So every morning uh, we have about a 15 to 30 minute call where we hop on Zoom or meet in person. And we talk about what's coming up this week. We talk about our projects. We talk if there's any issues. We just want to keep everyone in the loop. So a lot of my time is just coordinating between all staff so that everyone has the information they have. Um, and then I also do a lot of like reviewing or approving or um, uh, just making sure things are on track. And then I have responsibilities to our funders. So um, each, and this is very yearly, but each year we have to write a business plan. Each year we have to um, report on progress, uh, both in the middle of the year and at the end of the year. Um, so I do a lot of those um, throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the year. Uh, work on projects like that. Um, and then finally, throughout the week, I'll often have a couple meetings a day where I meet with outside stakeholders. So I'll meet with destination marketing organizations or economic development agencies or um, various you know people that work in municipalities in our region to update them both on what we're doing, but also get the information about what they're up to so that we can align and not duplicate efforts and just so we can understand what's happening. So a lot of meetings, um, a lot of reviewing and writing reports, and then a lot of thinking about what could go wrong, how can I prevent that? Or if something's going wrong, how can we make the impact as small as possible? Thank you for that. I also had a follow-up question. I know you mentioned like from switching the roles, it was definitely hands-on at first, and now it's more so like that admin and management yeah. stuff. How would you say is the best way to kind of, I guess, adapt to the change of not being the person to fix everything? Because I know like personally in my roles, like in whatever I'm involved in, it's hard for me to not step in and be like, oh, like I did this once and I would do it this way. So yeah. any advice on combating that? Yeah. And that's really tough. And I have to, I struggle with that all the time. So some of it is I'm forced to do it just because I don't, I know I personally don't have time to do um, everything that maybe I would want to do. Um, I also have a couple things that I've kept on to just because I loved that portion so much. I knew I needed it, 
in my current job so that I would also be fulfilled and I would be able to fulfill that kind of desire to have it. So I didn't give up absolutely everything. I tried to keep a couple of things just to keep that skill set up to date. Um, and then also uh, I had a couple like performance reviews with, with my staff and I try to make it very 360. So it's a dialogue. It's not just me saying, here are things I think you can improve on. I really want that feedback from people I work with. How can I improve? And they don't love it when I just do things that is their job. And, um, you know, I've had that communicated to myself. And that's really helped me because I try to put myself back in their shoes. And I wouldn't like it if someone did that to me. So just trying to be empathetic um, and, and trying um, has helped. But I am in no means an expert at it. And it's something that I'm, I'm definitely continuing to work on. Thank you. That's a great question. I think a lot of people struggle with that. <laughs> um, Afra, I know you joined us a little bit late, but um, wondered if you had any questions um, because you missed kind of the beginning introduction or if you just want to introduce yourself and say hi. Um, hi, I'm Afra. I actually work with Andrew. I'm just the practicum student. So I think I, I know just about everything that she talks about in her little spiel but no I don't really have any questions I thought about coming up with something but I don't have anything yet awesome well thanks for joining us anyways Amara has a question go ahead curious to learn about um what your favorite project has been that you've worked on during your career thus far or even just a project that has been particularly interesting to you yeah no that's a great question um I, I'm like a sucker for light shows. <laughs> um, that's just a personal thing. Like when I've traveled, I'm like drawn to them. So anytime that I can um, kind of put that into somewhere in our region, I'm really excited to do that. Um, some projects that I'm really proud of. One is um, uh, we, we call it the shareable moments challenge. And this was the idea of, again, how can we get people to take out their camera? So we put out a, a, a challenge to people in our region to come up with creative ideas for placemaking, like how can you make downtown cores or various places um, come alive? And so we, we did that for many years um, and some really cool projects, including some light ones, mural, new murals, new art installations. Um, we brought a, um, a giant inflatable moon to Stratford. It was about um, eight. Me, I think eight meters in diameter all the way. It was huge. It was lifted by a crane. It was above a um, an island, um, and we we helped support. So the uh, Shafford Summer Music was the one to bring this moon, and we were able to support them with some marketing and other things. But we we're also able to support animation around this giant moon, and so you could go and take take a picture of it as uh, as well, but. We also, through our support, helped create, there was a silent disco, there was yoga under the moon, there was story time for kids, there was a drum circle, like there's so many cool things that happened around it. And I think that was just such a great experience. Some other projects I'm proud of, um, we've been, and this is a project that has been years and years and years in the making, and it doesn't happen fast, but we're getting some real traction, was around the Grand River. So the Grand River goes through our RTO as well as through other RTOs. Um, and it's a it's a heritage river. It's a great asset. But the access sites, so the places that you could go to get on the river, were all in various levels of, of use and how good they were for, for guests. So we did a, an, a, a standards manual so that they could all, hopefully at one point at, uh, in time, get up to the same level. And uh, we completed our first access site, uh, Wilson's Flats, or so side of Alora, where we were able to, you know, add parking, add signage, add a canoe rack, add a washroom, make sure the ingress and egress is, is good, add seating. Um, that was our first one. Uh, we're, we uh, completed two more in the last five years. 
the one in Cambridge is breaking ground this spring. And then we have another one in Waterloo and Kitchener that are coming up hopefully in the next year or so. Um, and I think that's been a project that has a lot of legacy value um, that will make a difference to um, help protect and help animate the Grand River, which I think is great. But yeah, great question. It's hard to pick. Um, eight years, there's been some really cool things that we've been able to work on. And in my project, I had all different pictures of uh, things that we things that we have done throughout uh, my career there. Awesome. It's always fun to hear like what people's favorite projects have been and the interesting and creative work that you get to do that, you know, we wouldn't necessarily know we're here about. Um, mm -hmm. It makes me want to go find some of these spots along the Grand River. <laughs> right. Well, I'm not sure if there are any more questions from the group, um, but I wondered if you wanted to maybe close just on some final advice um, for our students as they, you know, are looking for further future co-op jobs and then, you know, eventually entering their careers. Yeah, um, just some final advice. Um, I think it's it's hard to reach out to people, but I think take any networking opportunities that you can, um, even if it's there might not be a direct job that comes out of it, but you can you know pick their brain a little bit, um, get some insight, and they might be able to direct you to someone or an opening that is. So taking advantage of trying to build those networks is, is really important. And again, just making sure that you're finding the right fit for you. Um, and it's okay to try a job, learn something from it and apply it to your next job, right? Um, that uh, movement is, is okay. And uh, I just, I did want to thank everyone for coming today. Thank you for your really great and insightful questions. Um, this was a real pleasure to do. And Again, don't hesitate to reach out to me if you think of a question or if you just want to chat about your future and careers and what it's like to work in tourism. I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time and for being here. Um, I don't want to forget Carlo's picture uh, for her social media. So if everyone doesn't mind being in a quick photo, um, that would be really great. Carlo, you tell us when you're ready. Yeah, if everyone can just... Give me a big smile. I'll take the screenshot right now. Should be good. I'll take another one just in case. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks. Um, but yeah, again, Andrea, thank you so much for your time and being here to talk to our students, um, even in a small group session. Appreciate that a lot. And um, I appreciate all the students joining us tonight and participating in these alumni office hour sessions and hope you're getting some good value out of, out of this program that we're that we've put together for you. Um, so thank you. Keep an eye on your email for a quick little um, feedback survey after the event. It's just a quick emoji selection. Um, pick the smiley face of your choice and let us know what you thought. And otherwise, have a great evening and uh, everybody get ready for the snowstorm. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks. And Andrea, you can hang on a minute. Sure.